Hey everyone, welcome back to another Encore study group. We are going to go through today switching mechanisms. It's a little bit of a more down-to-earth conversation, I'd say, than what we've been doing lately with the Encore Blueprint. We've been talking about things like software-defined access and software-defined WAN. And even though this, we've had a lot of fun talking about those, don't get me wrong, it's going to be nice to kind of return back to maybe some more traditional concepts, again, like switching mechanisms. So the fun thing about this agenda is that we're going to be talking about some concepts that we like to gloss over when we're reading CCNA materials, things like CAM tables and TCAM tables. But do we really understand what a CAM table is, independent of anything else? Like, why do we call them CAM tables instead of MAC address tables? And what's the difference between a CAM table and a TCAM table? And then what's the difference between centralized and distributed forwarding? So we're going to take a look at a lot of these concepts. Um, yes, yeah, process and fast switching, Ceph and Fib. So we're, <laughs> there's a lot to cover here today, as it seems like there always is in all of these sessions. As always, this session has been pre-recorded, so I am here in the chat live, ready to answer any questions you might have. So bring all of your questions. If you have questions about SDA or SD-WAN, those are fair game. We're an encore study group. So post any questions you might have, and as we work our way through switching mechanisms, if you have any questions, be sure to chime into the chat anytime. With that, Let's go ahead and take a look at, well, we're going to start off at the top of the list, which is content addressable memory or CAM. So when we're talking about a switch and we get traffic, network traffic coming into this switch, we understand we're CCNP candidates, right? We've studied the CCNA level of material. And so we understand from a layer two perspective that we have a source MAC address coming in and we're going to be destined towards another MAC address. And from a layer two perspective, we need to figure out what to do with this layer two frame that we just received. And so if my destination Mac, let's say my source address or source Mac is A, destination Mac is B, and I've got a host that's living out this interface, that's uh, Mac address B. Hey, let's call this interface, I don't know, one slash two. And we'll call this interface one slash one. So a couple of things are going to happen. Uh, again, this, is, this part is just a review. Um, from a CAM perspective, we're going to track all of this MAC address information. We're going to track the fact that, hey, I just got a frame on port 1 slash 1. So 1 slash 1 has uh, MAC address A living out of it. So we know that those two are paired up with one another. Incidentally, by the way, layer 2 traffic in the modern switching world especially is always going to belong to a particular VLAN. So let's say that this is all in VLAN 10 which means that we're going to track that also as belonging to VLAN 10. So there are really three different entities that we're storing at any given time in the CAM space. So next, we are going to hopefully know where MAC address B lives. If we do, then we know what to do with it. If not, then we're going to flood that traffic out, uh, all of our interfaces, in hopes of just trying to get it there. So that, that's, again, a CCNA level question, right? We, we get a frame in. We don't know where it's supposed to go. And so... What do we do with that packet? You know, if a router doesn't have a route, it's going to drop the route or the packet that came in. But if a switch doesn't have the destination address, it's simply going to flood it out. It prefers to just send it everywhere and hope for the best. And what's going to happen is eventually B will respond. And now switch this switch knows that um, MAC address B is attached to one slash two. And that's also out VLAN 10. So next time a packet comes in, the switch looks at its CAM table space. It knows that host B lives at one slash two, and it's simply going to forward that traffic out to the destination or the appropriate interface. And this was a far superior way of doing it relative to hubs. Hubs were a layer one device. And so any packet that came in was going to be forwarded out all interfaces, just like the flooding behavior we just described, except that's always going to happen. I remember back when I was you know, I, boy, how old was I? 16, 17, making LAN parties so we could play Warcraft and Starcraft and some of these early video games. And I remember just going out and buying or finding, I don't remember where I got them from, a couple of hubs. And all I knew was if I plugged the hubs in to each other, <laughs> daisy chained a couple of hubs off, I could have my, you know, 11 friends over or it always ended up being 10 friends. So we had 11 people trying to play team games. So figure that one out. It felt like we always ended up with the wrong number of people to have even teams. But either way, we had like 10, 11, 12 people all connected in. 
And what I didn't realize, and you know, 16 year old Jeff was happy that the network was all working and we were all communicating and playing video games together. But this was a nightmare from a networking perspective. I mean, it's, I, I love the fact that it worked because ethernet is just cool how it works even from a collision domain perspective. All these packets are getting flooded out, all of the interfaces at once, and there's collisions and backing off, and you know the CDMA stuff that, again, we studied as a CCNA was all making that network work, even though it was hubs flooding traffic everywhere. And that's great for 12 high school students trying to play a video game together, but not so great when we scale that out to hundreds or maybe even thousands of hosts in a business-oriented network. And so that's where switches came in. We said, you know, we're going to stop this flooding behavior. We're going to learn where all of our hosts are, and we're going to only forward the traffic out to the appropriate interface. So that's all great. Uh, again, this is CCNA level stuff. So Jeff, what what are we what are we doing here as an encore? candidate trying to study what switches do with frames. Well, the bigger concept here is not specific to the layer two switch. The bigger concept is understanding what exactly the cam table is, because throughout the course of this video, we're going to be covering other ways of storing information and comparing that back to content addressable memory or cam. So here's what cam is. Cam is beyond the concept of MAC address. I mean, i like most people, probably when you're sitting down and learning, I was like, oh, CAM is just, you know, Mac backwards. For whatever reason, CAM and Mac are just, I know it stands for content addressable memory, but that's an easy way to remember it. And for whatever reason, we call them CAM tables instead of Mac tables. And you could still go out and Google search this and you'll find on Yahoo uh, Answers and other forums, Cisco forums, um, people ask the question, why do we call them ta CAM tables? And the answer a lot of people like to give is just, well, we call them Mac tables anyway, so who cares? But there is an answer. There is a reason why it's content addressable memory. See, this concept, content addressable memory, is sort of the reverse of what standard RAM, how standard RAM operates. Standard RAM in a computer is based on having basically index, indices and data. And so we've got like, you know, think about a spreadsheet. Uh, index one data is, I don't know what kind of data are we storing, color data. We'll say we're storing color data. So index one is red, index two is blue, index three is green. And I'm going to remember, that's all on the screen, right? Okay, good. And I'm, as my computer, I'm storing information for later access. So I know that I stored the appropriate color information in index two, for example. So I'm gonna go to my memory, my computer, is going to go to the RAM and say, I need index two. What is at index two? Because the reason I'm using memory is to remember things, right? So I don't, so the CPU doesn't have to remember it. It's storing that information so it can forget it and do other things. Now the CPU is ready for that information. It goes to RAM, says I give me index two, and I'm getting back uh, the color at index two, which would be blue. That sounds great except that's not going to work so well for us from a MAC address perspective. We need a little bit more effective way of learning where MAC addresses are specifically. Remember, I'm going to look for source, the source, I'm sorry, not the source of MAC address, the destination MAC address. I'm looking up MAC address B. I don't have an index. I don't know what I'm, if I even have what I'm looking for in the table, the table might not have MAC address B. And so what content addressable memory is from a memory utilization or memory, uh, I guess, concept perspective, what it's doing is it's allowing us to look up the data, the data point. And so when instead, I, instead of looking up the index, like I just said earlier, I'm going to say, you know what? Here's my switch now. My switch is going to go to the cam and say, do you have B in there? And the cam table is going to respond with, if if B exists uh, in there, it's going to respond with the information. Um, specifically, by the way, we're going to say B and 10 uh, in VLAN 10's cam space. And then we're going to get back the port. So it's a it's a little bit of a nuance, but it it's significant. First of all, the biggest significance is that this is a binary operation. And that matters from the perspective of it has to be an exact match. 
So think about from a routing table perspective, think about slash 32 routes, right? I mean, we, we do this all the time. We are looking at our routing tables, hoping to find the best match. But we all kind of know intuitively when we're thinking about it from a CAM perspective that I never do that. I'm never looking for best matches. MAC addresses are might as well be totally random. They're made by the organization. It's an OUI plus some string of relatively random characters. And there's no organization in my network. There's no way that I can subnet MAC addresses, so to speak. And so really, I can just, all I can do is ask for the specific MAC address that I want and hope that I get a very fast response. So that's a key point as well. Uh, let me change colors here just because it's getting a little yellow. Actually, I'll change this there. Cam tables are built on very fast memory. Why is my drawing tablet not working? There we go. Very fast memory, which means it's expensive. This is faster than the standard RAM memory, whatever you want to call it. It's faster than the standard stuff that we put in our computers and in our uh, even in our switches in some cases. So that's why we can run out of space because we're not just going to put infinite amounts of CAM and TCAM together. We're going to talk about TCAM here in a moment. It's built on the same high-speed memory, but it needs to be a very fast lookup. I'm getting packets in from the network and I need to very quickly know what to do with that packet or from the layer two perspective, a frame. So um, it's fast memory and it allows me to do a very specific lookup. That's that's our cam. Okay? And, and that's the extent of it. I mean, we're not going to draw on this for too long. Uh, just understanding that, uh, you know, a few things here. First of all, we're storing three pieces of information in the cam space. It's on fast and expensive memory. Again, we, we can't, we don't have infinite, we don't want to have infinite amounts of it. We want to sell our switches for less than $100,000 each. So, you know, we're, we got to conserve that. And we are we are providing a specific content. We're it's really what we're doing. I should have used that word earlier. We're providing the content that we're looking for, and we're getting a response back. Hopefully, that we have it. If not, we get uh, a non-response back, so to speak, and we know what to do with it at that point. Okay, that's that's the key part of CAM. Next, we need to consider TCAM. So different situation here, but very similar. Now I have a router and I get a packet in. Now it's a layer three packet. And I've got a source IP address and a destination IP address, except as we just talked about, we organize our IP networks a little bit differently. We use this concept of subnet masks. And so even though I've got a destination IP address, whatever this is, uh, I really what I wanna do is I want to look at my routing table and I wanna get information out of it, but not necessarily, it doesn't have to be an exact match. We understand this concept of subnet masks, again, being CCNP candidates, we've already studied subnetting quite extensively. So we understand we have this concept of a network mask. But again, think back to CAM space. We don't support network masks in CAM. It has to be an exact match. So if our routing world was all slash 32 routes and we weren't doing any subnetting whatsoever, then we could rely on CAM in order to store our routing table information. Instead, however, we have the TCAM, we, we need TCAM space, and the TCAM is going to allow us to store both the, hold up, um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all the information. It's the IP address, it's the subnet mask, which really, this is the key part, because it's the don't care bits. I can know what whether I care about a bit or not doesn't have to be an exact match. And then I have my next hop interface or next hop IP address for that matter, All right? This, this TCAM space is where I store IP routes. It's where I store things like access control lists because access control lists use those wildcard masks. And by the way, also QoS settings. So when we think about uh, forming MQC policies, and a lot of times we're going to apply access lists to those. So now we've got masks involved with QoS settings uh, to the point that if we're not careful, if we have too many access control list entries on a switch, we can run out of TCAM space because again, it's built on the same fast memory that CAM is built on. So anytime we pull up a, a Cisco switch as a, you know, a data, a data sheet is what I'm driving at. 
We pull up a Switch's data sheet. It will tell us how many routes it's capable of learning, assuming it's a layer three device. It'll tell us even how many MAC addresses it can learn. It'll tell us how many access control lists it can store. And that's all based on the a couple of things. First of all, we know how much space we have for the CAM table. The only thing we use CAM table for is for layer two forwarding. With TCAM, we're gonna put so much memory in there, but we're usually going to divide the TCAM space into three different sections and allow us to you know, not impede on the other. But a lot of devices will also allow us to move. Maybe we don't need a lot of access control lists. So we're going to move some of the ACL and the QoS space into the IP routing space if we have a large layer three environment. Furthermore, um, I think I was gonna say this later, but IPv6 addresses are large enough that it actually requires in, whoop, yeah, my drawing tablet is not doing so well today. It requires two times the TCAM spaces. So every IPv6 address that I store in my routing table is going to take up two slots relative to IPv4. And that's simply because of the number of bits that are in the IPv6 address. It just takes more memory to store that information. As a result, a lot of switching platforms allow us to move the TCAM space around. So I remember like 3750s, which I spent a lot of time on as a CCIE candidate because that's what my exam was based on. Uh, that had a mode where you could boot it up into an IPv6 mode of operation. You could also boot it up into layer two operation where it would put all of the DKIM space more or less into the QoS and access control list because of vacles and again, QoS settings and such where we don't need any routing space. Or again, with IPv6, in order to enable IPv6, you had to allocate extra TCAM space for the routing tables, okay? So that's what the difference is between ternary CAM or TCAM and content addressable memory or CAM. Um, all right, so TCAM, we're gonna store what they call value mask and results. Um, or VMRs, okay? Value mask result. So really what we're looking at here, the value is gonna be the IP address. The mask is truly just the mask. And the result is, is more or less a, a, a yay or a nay, okay? It's good, it, um, from an access control list perspective, it could be a deny or allow. Uh, from a QoS perspective, it could specify which queue to place that traffic into. So it just depends on the scenario here and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think the last thing I wanna say about CAM and TCAM, beyond every, and, and we kind of already alluded to this, I suppose, but because it's fast memory, keep in mind that the CPU of these devices is never being tapped. We're, we're able to look up all this information without without bothering the CPU, basically. The, it, the switch can look up, bring a packet in and just access the CAM space using the ASICs, look up the destination and forward it onto the appropriate address. And that's great, that's not how it always was. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say it like that. From a CAM perspective, that is how it always was. But from a routing perspective, now we need to look and see all of the different ways that we we're storing information and how we we're accessing that information. So we're just moving right along. I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions about CAM, TCAM, et cetera, please chime into the chat and I will do my best to answer. And um, if you've got anything else, then don't hesitate to ask as well. Okay, we are already moving on to routing tables. So, uh, the routing table is known as the routing information base. Okay, so we've got, which again, otherwise known as the routing table, but understand that the rib is something that we don't particularly want to access a whole lot. If at all possible, we'd really rather not look up information in the rib. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's very CPU intensive to take information out of the routing table directly. Okay, so, um, but that said, that said, first of all, let's understand what the rib is. Okay, we've got a lot of different routing protocols. We've got things like OSPF and EIGRP and BGP. And the routing protocols themselves are going to pull information by these relationships. So OSPF neighbors, EIGRP neighbors, BGP peers. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to store all of that information. OSPF stores it in a database. The IGRP stores it in the topology table. BGP stores it in its table, the BGP table. And all of this information is being stored as part of the routing protocol, but it's not getting installed into the rib yet. At the point that we've learned all of this information, now we can start injecting it into the rib. One thing that takes a little while to just fully grasp as especially you know, even somebody who's passed the CCNA is to understand this process because OSPF, we get hung up on this administrative distance issue. We know OSPF has an administrative distance of 110 and EIGRP has an administrative distance of 90 and BGP, depending on internal or external, is either 20 or 200. And so we look at those numbers and we know that lower number wins and so EIGRP will always win over OSPF and therefore if we learn an OSPF route and an EIGRP route, EIGRP wins, life is good, right? Except the route that I learned via OSPF is going to stay inside that database. This database has zero bearing on the rib and vice versa. They don't care about the information that's stored in each other other than simply do I install a, dev a, a route that you learned into the routing table. Meaning if I have decided not to install a route into the routing table doesn't mean that the database has forgotten it. In fact, we want that route to be available in the OSPF database because if the EIGRP route, which is stored in the topology table, is forgotten or not forgotten, but is, is lost for whatever reason, or we've lost our EIGRP route, but we still have an OSPF route. So let's go ahead and install that into the routing table. This point right here is where routes are compared to one another. They are not compared, the, the OSPF database, the EIGRP topology table, the BGP table, these are not comparing in any way to one another. We only compare them when we're installing routes into the routing table. So OSPF learns of a route, we install that into the routing table, we've got an O route here, and then EIGRP learns the exact same route, and we decide, okay, well, EIGRP's got the same route, EIGRP has a better administrative distance, so EIGRP is going to win that. So we get rid of the OSP route and we install the EIGRP route, which yes, is designated as a D. So now we've got, um, wait, just wanna make sure, uh, do, 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 do. yes. But keep in mind, it's only if the routes are identical. That was the point I wanted to make. So from an OSPF perspective, if we have OSPF routes of 192.168, dot 100 dot zero and it's slash 24 and then EIGRP learns a route and it's 192.168.100.0 dot 100 dot zero slash 23 those routes are not the same and therefore both of them will get installed into the routing table and that is something that we absolutely have to understand is on core candidates it's a per route comparison we as humans, we want to stop after the dot zero, but the computers, the routers, they look at the slash notation as well as part of that route. And so that's what we have to make sure that we are doing as well. In fact, this is, this is a question that I used to use on, um, on interviews. So technical interviews, I do the technical interview for the company I used to work for. And this, it's, I was never trying to catch anybody. I just wanted to know where they were in their networking journey. That was always my goal. If you said you're a CCNP, then I'm gonna have a conversation with you enough to know whether you really are a CCNP or not. Not whether you passed the exam, because you probably did, but whether you actually have the skill set of a CCNP. And so I'd love to ask this question because I got to watch people talk through the process and realizing that, especially something like this, where I'd say, okay, is the OSPF route or the EIGRP route preferred? And a lot of times the CCNA candidate knows EIGRP wins over OSPF because we have memorized that. However, EIGRP wins over OSPF here at this moment in time before it gets to the routing table. So if I look at my routing table and I see these two routes next to each other, we're done with comparing OSPF and EIGRP. Once we're looking at the routing table, we are looking for most specific route. We're gonna look through the whole routing table and find the best fit for our, uh, our, for our lookup. Now, most specific route means highest subnet mask. And so if I'm 
trying to route towards 192.168.100. Doesn't matter at this point. <laughs> um, because one of these, you know, th this one right here, the more specific route has 100.0 through 100.255. And uh, the AGRP route is going to be 100.0 through 101.255. So it's got more IP addresses in that subnet mask because it's a slash 23. Okay. Instead of a slash, you know, if we were to go slash 24, that's, that's half as many. If we go slash 25, that's half as many there. And so the higher the number, the more specific we get. So in this situation, go as long as I'm going towards dot 100 dot five or something that starts with dot 100, it'll take the OSPF route every single time because it's more specific. So keep that in mind. I, I mean, that's fair game on the Encore, I suppose, but just in general, remember once it's in the routing table, it's most specific. Only before it gets put into the routing table do we actually compare administrative distances. That is important, not really particularly related to switching mechanisms, but at the same time, as we're talking about the rib and the routing table, it's just sort of a good time to as Encore candidates lock into this concept that honestly, even senior network engineers forget every now and again, because we're all human and we all look at the routing table and we all very, very quick to say EIJRP yeah, beats OSPF. And we forget that way. They're both in the routing table. So it has nothing to do with OSPF and EIJRP at this point. It only has to do with most specific. Okay. Uh, where are we going from here? Uh, metric pods. Okay, so um, just to I guess put a cap on this conversation, uh, let's say these are both OSP. Well, I, I guess uh, where was I going with that? Basically, if we have two different routes in the EIGRP topology table, at that point, by the way, because I haven't mentioned metric or cost yet, this is where we do metric and cost. So we're going to compare metric and we're going to compare cost. Metric is an EIGRP word. OSPF uses cost and and such. Um, we're going to compare our routes. BGP doesn't use metric or cost. It has its own uh, path selection algorithm, they call it. And so what we want to do here is figure out which of our routes is the best is the best candidate. So I might have two different neighbors advertising the route to me. One of them is just a better metric, and that's great. At this point over here is when we compare them still to other routing protocols. But at this point, we're putting our best foot forward, so to speak. It's like you go to OSPF and you're like, hey, give me your best candidate. And you go to EIGRP and you're like, hey, give me your best candidate. So they both submit their best candidates. OSPF is searching its database as well and deciding, you know, based on cost, which path I'm going to take. Uh, the dirty secret here is that we already know that the contest has been fixed and EIGRP will always win as long as you're both submitting the same route. All right, but again, we don't compare costs, we don't compare metrics, and we don't do any of that once we're in the routing table. We don't look at metrics or costs or administrative distance. The routing table will tell us the metric, the cost, the administrative distance of the route that's been installed, but if I haven't said it enough at this point, it will use the most specific route regardless of the cost metric or administrative distance. Whew, okay. All right, next up, let's keep talking about routers. So now we've got a router and it brings a packet in and it needs to figure out that this packet with a destination IP address of A, let's say, is supposed to go out this interface, whatever this is. Let's call this fast ethernet zero slash zero. So it came in on fast ethernet zero slash one, not that that particularly matters in this scenario, but this is the situation. How does the router know what to do with this packet? We tend to skip through all of the nitty gritty details of this in our day-to-day -day networking journey. I mean, we just know that it's in the routing table and we do a show IP route, we see where the route is and we know it's gonna go out fast ethernet zero slash zero because that's what the route says. But the problem with that is if the CPU has to go and find out what's in the routing table every single time a packet comes in, the router's gonna grind to a halt. And, and this is how routers used to work. In fact, we called it process switching. So yes, even though it's a router, it still needs to switch packets. 
this process of bringing a packet in on one interface and out the other interface is called switching, where we're taking it from one inter I mean, that, that's just get used to that concept. It's not just layer three switches that switch, routers switch as well. Any layer three device is going to do a routing table lookup and then switch the packet between the interfaces. So the concept of process switching is simply that the CPU is going to handle this. The CPU is going to, well, first of all, the packet might not come in when the CPU is ready to do its, to do its check. You know, CPUs have processes and it's, you know, I mean, it's just like me. If I, I can only do one thing at a time, I, I tell my kids all the time, you know, I'm in the middle of doing something and they start talking to me. It's, it's not usually, I shouldn't say it like that. What usually is the situation is one of my kids is talking to me and I'm like looking at something of theirs. And then one of my other kids starts talking to me. I'm the phrase that I like to use is I, I, I can only do one thing at a time. I'm sorry. I'm not a multitasker. <laughs> I can do this really well. And then I can do that really well, but I cannot do both at once. Um, and, and CPUs are, of course, the exact same way. They can only do things in serial fashion. So this CPU is tick, tick, ticking through, slow down time, right? It's, I'm gonna do this process, I'm gonna do that process, I'm keeping the lights on, right? I'm doing this and doing this, and oh look, it's time for me to, to run the IP input process. And so now I'm going to check to see if I have any packets available. Well, that packet might have arrived 18 cycles ago. That probably not cycles, but you know what I mean, 18 ticks ago, whatever you want to call it. And so I guess maybe that is cycle. So either way, I, the packet had to be stored in memory. So now the CPU has to go pull that packet out of memory, say, okay, now I'm ready for you. Where are you trying to go? Oh, you're trying to go to IP address A. Well, let me go find out where IP address A lives. And so I'm gonna go to the routing table, routing information base, which is stored in the TCAM. And I'm going to do my check against that. The CPU goes out to the rib, gets the information, and now we can switch the packet. As you can imagine, this is not going to go great at scale. <laughs> uh, our CPUs are busy doing other things. We can't store packets in memory. The packet, when it comes in, it's it's already like too late, right? We got to get that packet going as soon as we can. It's just the nature of networking in general, let alone the modern internet. And so the with the amount of packets that our routers have to process, we can't do process switching anymore. It just doesn't scale. Our CPUs will get bogged down. Um, you know, it, the, one of the concepts of this, by the way, is if you run debugs on every single, if you do debug IP, is it debug IP packet any or IP any? It's been way too long since I've run the command because you shouldn't run the command. <laughs> because when you're debugging, dug, de debugging all IP packets, every single packet has to be process switched. And you can very quickly bring a network to its knees if you run the wrong debug command on a core switch. We do not have time for the CPU to handle every single uh, packet that comes in. Okay, So somebody a little smarter decided that, wait, let me just make sure. Yes, um, the only thing I, I forgot to add that's in my notes is that the uh, I, as part of all of this, the um, the CPU is also going to have to check the ARP table because usually it's, you know, I, I've got my next hop address, but I need to know the MAC address of that next hop. I don't just forward it out an interface. I've got to have a destination MAC address so I can form that layer two header. And so, yes, it's not just the rib. It's also the ARP table. So as we can tell, that happening for every packet isn't going to fly. So then we have this concept of fast switching. Fast switching is definitely smarter than process switching. And this is a cache based system. So the idea here is that a packet arrives and its destination is for IP address A and my router hasn't gotten anything towards IP address A. And so it's going to do process switching. Fast switching is based on process switching still. It's just only going to do it for the first packet that's destined for that IP address. So the difference is once I know that IP address A lives out fast ethernet zero slash zero, I'm going to store that in a cache. Now, when a packet comes in, I can check the cache while the CPU is off doing its own thing. I can check the cache, find out, oh, I know where that lives. It lives out fast ethernet zero zero, and I can send it on over to fast ethernet zero zero without ever consulting the CPU. 
This is a huge step in the right direction. We've, we don't have to worry about the ZPU as much anymore, but as much is kind of the key phrase there, right? Because we still need the CPU for the first packet of every single destination. And, and also the other flaw in this would probably be the size of the cache. I mean, at some point the cache is probably going to uh, get over overwhelmed or at least fill up depending on the size of my network. And so there are two primary problem situations with this. The first would probably be that, you know, if you're a network that everybody comes in at 8 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whatever time all your users show up and they all flip their computers on at the same time and they all start routing across your network, well, that's a huge flood that of, of process switching that's going to happen at the very start of every single day. So if, if all things were created equal and you're just traffic, traffic routing evenly throughout the 24 hours, then, you know, it's, it's going to be less of a hit at any particular time. But the bigger problem, probably, is that this is no good in the middle of the internet. Because in the middle of the internet, at any time, I could get a packet destined for anywhere. And my router in my remote site is half the time sending that traffic towards my data center or towards a, a resource I'm hosting or maybe another branch site. But once those, once that cache has been populated, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. Whereas, um, Whereas in the middle of the internet, I can't, there, there is no concept of learning all of the addresses. I mean, there's just so many addresses out on the internet that uh, my, my core devices are just going to be overwhelmed. Okay. Huh. And on top of that, by the way, um, what, what if a route changes? What if my OSPF route went down and now, well, I guess maybe it doesn't really matter. My OSPF route went down and now I have to rely on my EIGRP route. Now my cache is no longer updated. So I need to flush that entry and process switch again. So it's just, it, it was, again, it's a very good step in the right direction, but it's still, at the end of the day, it's still process switching and it's still involving my CPU more than what I can afford. All right. So next is Cisco. Whoops. I need a new color for this. What color should I use? I've used green. I've used all the, I basically have used all the colors. I need to use red because red is bad. I'm going to go purple, even though it's close to the pink I already used. Next is Cisco Express Forwarding. Seth. So a lot of us, I don't know about you. Like I, I you know, all, all this information is swimming around in my head somewhere. Uh, I'm not every day thinking about, oh, the fact that Seth is running and, and process switching versus fast switching and all, all of this stuff. Right. Um, but but at the minimum, we probably all know that Ceph on some level is the secret to at least Cisco's early success. I mean, Cisco was able to solve this problem early on by introducing Cisco Express Forwarding. And Cisco Express Forwarding relies on what we call the forwarding information base. So the forwarding information base is going to do a couple of things for us. First of all, we're taking a proactive approach to this problem, okay? Remember, we, even with Ceph, even modern networking equipment, we cannot get away from the fact that we are storing all this information in a routing information base. The rib is where all of our routing information happens. And if left as is, my CPU is going to have to go get that information on, on the occasions that I need it. So the idea that Cisco had was, okay, we, we've got all that information. Let's move that information preemptively into a different cache. And that would be the fib. The fib is more or less a copy of the routing table with a slight twist. Remember what I said earlier, and I'm glad I remember to say it because it's a very key point. I need another color uh, and we'll just stick with it. So this, this packet comes in and the way the router reads the IP header is by stripping off the layer two frame header. Yeah, I said that right. So we strip off the ethernet source and destination address and we look at the IP address and that's great. And then we are ready to forward it on to the next interface. But you remember what I said? Like we need a next hop. This is layer three operation. I've got a layer three interface here. I'm going to send it to another layer three interface, wherever that is up here. And when I traverse a layer three boundary, I'm now on a different layer two segment. 
So whatever MAC address was the destination of this original frame that showed up, that destination MAC address should have been me, my MAC address. So I knew from a router perspective that it was destined for me because I was somebody else's next hop. I told them I could get them to that, uh, to that subnet. They trusted me, maybe foolishly, I don't know. But either way, they trusted me and they sent me that packet and they destined the MAC address to my, be my MAC address. So now that IP address, uh, that MAC address rather has been stripped off. I, I can't use it because it's my MAC address anyways. I need the source MAC address to be me. Uh, yeah, I will just say, yeah, we'll just do that. So the source MAC address, which is me, and the destination MAC address, which is uh, them, we'll just say. <laughs> uh, you know what, I'll, I'll specifically call it out. It's, it's the next hop. Wherever I'm sending it on that I'm trusting that they can get it for me. Now, the other possibility is it's a local, like I'm actually attached to the host. So if, I've, if I'm a router and I've got a layer three interface that's on a LAN segment and I've got the PC on that LAN segment, the situation is the exact same. I need to know what your layer two address is so that this frame can get across the layer two network. And so what I said earlier was once we have the information, we also need to check the ARP table. The ARP table is a key part of this process because I need to ARP, potentially I, may, I might need to actually send literally an ARP request to the, uh, the next hop to say, hey, I know your IP address. I know my next hop IP address is 1.1.1.2 or whatever, but I need your MAC address. And so I'm just going to broadcast that out from a layer two perspective. I'm going to flood it out there and just say, hey, where in this layer two domain are you? 1.1.1.2 and 1.2, 1.1.1.2, uh, two, <laughs> the next app is going to respond and tell me, hey, here's my MAC address. Then, then now that I have it, I've got to build a layer two header. It's astounding when you look at all of the things that have to happen for just one packet to get through a router. All of the table lookups, the the information we have to have, stripping off information off of the frame, adding a new frame header onto it, like all of this stuff has to happen. And these routers are switching these packets in under a millisecond. I, I, it, it's incredible and it boggles the mind. We slow this down, you know, in the course of time, we've been talking now for almost 45 minutes, these routers have switched millions, if not billions of packets. I don't pretend to know what my scale is. So millions or billions, but either way, um, lots and lots of packets can be processed, which is, which is good for us. We want our networks to be fast, but that's the point. We want our networks to be fast and we don't want this whole process switching and fast switching to, um, to, to carry over into this modern networking world. We want to be rid of the CPU. And so what the FIB is going to do, let's come full circle here. Remember, we're talking about Cisco Express forwarding, which relies on the forwarding information base. The forwarding information base is going to have the route, it's going to have the mask, and it's going to have the uh, the, net, the layer two, basically the layer two header already pre-built. So remember, we're being proactive here. That's the biggest thing with Ceph, is I'm saying, okay, uh, I've got this route towards 192.168.100.0 slash 24, whatever my route is, I'm going to store that information. And I know that my next hop is 1.1.1.2 or whatever. I know I'm now I'm mixing private and public IP addresses. So whatever, I'm going to learn what my next hop is. I'm going to store the layer two information, the layer two header in the Ceph table. That way, when the packet comes in, I don't have to process switch not even for the first time, I've never even gotten a packet destined for this subnet, but I've already populated my Ceph table. Therefore, I can bring that packet in, I can look it up by, by the route and by the mask, and I can construct, I can just swap out headers, rip out that header, put in this header, I've already constructed it. Source MAC address is me, destination MAC address is my next hop. I've already got it all figured out. So I just, and I, Send it off. The, the sound effects are definitely part of the routing process. All right. Um, I did, well, I'm just checking my notes here. Make sure. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's really it. 
So if, uh, if you have any questions at all about process switching, fast switching, or Ceph, or even back to the rib, or all the way back to the camera, the T-cam, ask away if you're watching this live. If you're watching this not live, by the way, then feel free to post a YouTube comment. I do my best to come back and answer any questions that you might have after the fact. All right. So um, that's that. Get rid of all that fun information. Next up, which is the last topic, we're going to probably end a few minutes early today. That's never a terrible thing, I guess. Uh, I think that might be the first time I've ever said that, by the way. Centralized and distributed forwarding. I actually really like this sub subject uh, because this ties into network design as well. So like if you're looking to be a network architect one day, you want to make network designs and have design principles in your mind as you're figuring out which switch to grab. I was, I'm trying to remember when I learned about distributed versus centralized switching. I feel it's been so long, I can't remember, but I feel like it was even after I got my CCIE. That's what I feel like. I feel like it was when I was learning to do designs after I already had my CCIE, because for whatever reason, this topic never appeared on the blueprint back when I was studying. Unless I've got my timing off, but even if I do, it wasn't much before I got my IE. So this is a really cool concept. And it's simply a matter of looking at systems that are scaling out. So let's let's think of a few. Um, We've, we've talked about the cam, we've talked about the T-cam and the rib and the fib and all these things. Then we look at a chassis switch. Let me just draw it centrally here. Then we look at a, uh, that's, yeah, we can do better. Let's make it a real rectangle. That was more of a trapezoid. There we go. So now we have a chassis switch. And I don't know about you, but when I think of chassis switches, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For a lot of people, it's going to be the supervisor. I've got a supervisor line card that I've got to have in there. I've got line cards that I'm going to slide in. All of my ports are on my line cards. I probably didn't need to write ports twice, but here we go. And then we also have uh, the supervisor and this, this is the brains of the outfit to the point that I like to have redundant supervisors in here. And then I install other line cards in the chassis above. So this is my breakdown of my device. So here's the question. Where are all of these tables? Because you and I are probably going to look at that and say, well, rib, fib, T cam, cam, all that's probably going to be in the brains of the outfit, right? And so all of all of these concepts are probably going to live here. And technically, we're probably true in most cases. Um, but there are situations where this isn't the case. Here's what I mean by this. Let's say the cam table, the T-cam table, the rib, the fib, all of these things are stored on the supervisor. Now we get a packet in on a line card. This packet needs to be destined out towards maybe, you know, we'll just say an interface on the same line card. Okay, we, we know we're looking at this from the outside and we know that this packet coming in on port, let's say one slash one is going to be destined for one slash two. So same line card, different port, what does this packet flow look like? Well, I can tell you, given that we just said all of this information is on the brains, this packet has to be forwarded through the back plane to the active supervisor and then forwarded back to the same line card so that it can get forwarded out the appropriate interface. That seems inefficient, but yet that's what we have to do. We don't have a choice because we just looked at all of this information and we know that we need the rib and the fib and, and the T-cam space and the, and the cam tables. We need all of that information in order to make forwarding decisions. And so now we're looking at this and saying, all right, this is really inefficient. What are we gonna do about it? Um, well, there are there is something we can do about it. And we could move the, all of these tables to the line cards themselves. So let's back up for a moment. This topology right here is known as the as a centralized forwarding mechanism or a centralized forwarding model. Okay, when we're centralized and doing uh, centralized forwarding, um, yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to make sure I got the term right there. Um, when we're talking about that, the tables are only going to be on the supervisor. Now, when we think about centralized platforms, usually what we're talking about 
are going to be 4,500s. Um, if, if, if you've been around networking for a while, by the way, and you've walked into a data center or, or a network core, and you've seen 4,500s versus like 6,500s, and you're like, what's the difference? This is a big difference, okay? That said, 6,500s, so 4,500s are always centralized. 6,500s and 6,800s can be centralized. It depends on the line cards. To the point that I remember, oh shoot, like 15 years ago, let's say like 2005 time frame, um, maybe even like late 90s to mid 2000s, like even like schools were deploying 6,500 chassis. And I know by the time I was really doing a lot of network designs in the early 2010s, mid 2010s, 6,500s were expensive, and especially when they became 6,800s. And we have these 10 gig line cards. And I remember thinking like, how did schools ever afford 6,500s? Well, the reason why K-12s and small companies could afford a 65, oh, whatever, um, seven maybe, 65, 13s, some of these, um, 6509s, there wasn't this, was there 6507? Either way, 6807. But um, the reason they could afford them was because they were buying centralized line cards. They were buying line cards that didn't have TCAM space. They were buying line cards that didn't have the ribs and the fibs locally stored. And remember what we said, that high, high speed memory is expensive. And so if you wanted a distributed model, what we call that, um, then you had to go with more expensive line cards. Now, some line cards could be bought as a centralized um, card, and then you could actually install a daughter card onto it, and it would turn it into a distributed line card because you'd be adding all of the TCAM space and the CAM space that it needed in order to make its own forwarding decisions. So, um, oh, what else? Oh, by the way, uh, I mentioned data centers earlier. Uh, what about the, the Nexus 2K line? These are kind of a weird switch that are actually part of a virtual chassis topology where you'd connect them to a parent switch. But same thing, if a if a packet shows up on a Nexus 2K and it's destined out an interface on the same Nexus 2K, it has to forward it all the way up to its parent Nexus switch. So that's the concept of centralized forwarding. When we're talking about centralized versus distributed, centralized means that we have to for whoops, we have to forward it to the brains of the operation. Um in, in our case, it would be a supervisor or an upstream nexus switch or whatever the brain is, All right? So we wanna get away from that. As you can imagine, we would, well, yes and no. Okay, so <laughs> from a design perspective, this is cheap and it's really good still. Like it looks inefficient, but unless it's like your data center and your network core, if it's just an edge switch, processing packets coming in from laptops and PCs and printers. This is fantastic. We, we don't ever need to move away from a centralized model because we're not talking about so many packets. We're not talking about um, so much network latency that we have to worry about it. This is why, I mean, we've done a lot of network designs where we just deployed 4,500s to the edge or stackable switches, which are a different conversation. But um, you know, early stackable switches were a centralized model where it had to be forwarded to the master switch stack. So now let's talk about distributed. If we want distributed, a distributed uh, architecture, well, we'll say distributed forwarding. If we want distributed forwarding, now we're going to take, again, the CAM, the TCAM, the RIB, whoops, the TCAM, the RIB, the FIB. We're gonna take all of that and we're going to put it on the line card itself. I already said it once, I'll say it again. This is not a cheap operation. We're talking about taking a line card that was probably pretty cheap, and now we're turning it into a line card that might be four to five times as much. We're talking about money, <laughs> not weight. So uh, yes, it will weigh a little bit more because of the added stuff. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're just, it's, it's going to cost a little bit more money or a lot more money, depending on the situation. And But now, now, when that packet comes in for that line card, the line card has the intelligence to look it up. It doesn't need to forward it to the supervisor anymore. So we can simply take that and forward it out the appropriate interface. And they say, well, what about another line card? What if it was destined for the line card on the bottom? Well, in a distributed model, 
we've got the backplane capability of sending it straight to the line card that it needs to go out. And so it's going to go out the appropriate line card at that point, uh, so long as both ends are distributed. So we, what we really want to do is make sure that this matters. Like this is our core switch again, or our data center switch. There's no point in deploying this type of architecture to the edge of our networks in a lot of cases, but we do need to understand the difference between these. So when we think about distributed forwarding, you know, I already mentioned the 6500s. I'm going to put them over here as well. 6500s and 6800s. Oh, by the way, I'm, yeah, I blanked on talking about, I'll get to Catalyst 9Ks because that's what everybody's buying here. But um, stepping back five years, you know, 6500s, 6800s, by the time Cisco really evolved that platform over time, what we had is we had early 6500s that were centralized. Then over time, they came out with 4500s that were centralized and 6500 line cards that were distributed. But they had a mix of both. They had centralized and decentralized 6500s uh, line cards. And then over time again, the 4500s stayed centralized. The 4500s were the centralized platform of choice. And then you had the 6500s, or I'll even write the 6800s, that were fully decentralized. So over time, the 6500 line became a more distributed platform, which makes, made it a whole lot more expensive. So comparing a like 2015 6500 with a 2005 6500 it could be a whole lot more expensive, even though it's the same number of ports and the same throughput potentially, as long as we, it was the same throughput. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of 10 gig ports back in 2005, but we, you know, we had gig ports. And, and a, the reason why they're more expensive is because all the line cards started becoming distributed. Um, in fact, in here, in this range, this is when I talked about there were cards that by default were centralized, but then you could put a daughter card on there. But I remember looking at like doing the network designs and there was a, a 10 gig line card for the 6500 somewhere in like the probably the 2010, 2011 timeframe. And I just could not believe how much it was from a cost perspective. Um, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, why is this so, so expensive compared to, you know, all of the other cards? I, I get that it's 10 gig. At the time, 10 gig was new-ish, but like, why was it so expensive? Well, especially compared to, there were some, um, very quickly, there were some 10 gig line cards that came out for the 4500s. Way less expensive. I'm like, why in the world there's the, are the 10 gig line cards so expensive on the 6500s and so not expensive on the 4500s? Because in hindsight, or as I very quickly learned, 6,500 line cards had the TCAM space. They had the CAM space. It had all of the information so it could do distributed forwarding. Oh, I guess we're not going to get done early. Ah, how about that? But that's okay. Um, we're wrapping up here. We're going to wrap up on time instead of early. That's that's a-okay. I'm okay with on time. Um, I just got excited about this topic, I guess. So all that to say, other line card or other, other models, uh, we're talking about like Nexus 7Ks for example, those were 100% distributed. You could not buy a line card for a Nexus 7K that was not uh, was not centralized. Um, 9Ks, by the way, same thing. Nexus 9Ks, they're all distributed. Um, so, oh, that's right. I was like, what else, what, what else were we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about the Catalyst 9Ks. So the Catalyst 9Ks are, are a platform that really are what I should have been talking about from the beginning, potentially, because this is really the modern platform. But we, especially those who have been in the networking industry for so long, these are the platforms that we're used to seeing from a chassis perspective. However, we do have, for example, the 9400s, the Catalyst 9400s, those are chassis switches. Those are very similar to the 4500s and they're centralized. Meanwhile, we've got 9600 chassis switches for you know Catalyst uh, Catalyst 9600s <clears throat> that are very similar to the 6Ks. Those are distributed forwarding. You're going to see that the 9600s are more expensive than the 9400s, and this is part of the reason why. So from a network design perspective, I mean, what are we trying to learn here? Basically just that we need to find the right fit for the need. So 
if we are going to the network edge, absolutely centralized. If we're going to network distribution layer, depending on the size of the environment, and this would be a conversation with Cisco or your design, you know, if you don't have all of the information in front of you, you need to figure out based on my scale, does it make sense to go with a distributed or a centralized model? Network cores, data center cores, usually we wanna keep those distributed as long as again, the scale makes sense. So there's a lot of subjectivity when it comes to network design. Unfortunately, I can't even just sit here and say, if you've got a thousand users, then go with this. I mean, it just depends on the network. And so um, that's our job as network designers to try to figure this out. From an Encore perspective, just understand that Cisco could ask us any of this <laughs> stuff on the exam. Um, in fact, I mean, I pull all this information right off the blueprint. It's it's right there talking about fib, you know, switching mechanisms, fib, rib, cam, and tcam. And so again, if you got any questions, please post into the chat. I will hang out here for another five to 10 minutes to answer any questions you might have. And as always, as mentioned earlier, if you're not watching this live, then please feel free to post your questions into the chat or into the comment section, and I will answer as best I can. So with that, everyone, um, next time we're gonna be talking about wireless, a little bit of wireless, um, I don't have the exact topic in front. I think it's wireless design principles, that's right. So <laughs> we ended this topic talking about design stuff. We're gonna start the next topic talking about design. It's just going to be um, based on wireless. We're not gonna be talking about switching mechanism anymore, and switching mechanisms as much as wireless stuff. So that'll be a fun topic. I hope to see you there. Uh, with that, I think that's all I got. So we'll see you in two weeks, everyone. Bye-bye.